All right. Well, thank you all for coming out. There are lunches in the back for those of you who want to feel free to grab one. Um, and thank you, we think, to our um, virtual audience as well. So just kind of as a heads up, we are recording this and we are also attempting to simulcast this. So we have people online right now watching and hopefully listening um, if the audio is working properly. Some of you have some little markers at your tables with a little bit of a sign warning you that that is going to be recording. That's just so you know that, that you might be being picked up. So, you know, just kind of watch the side conversations. With that, I am going to hand things over to the faculty of the languages department for their uh, discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'm Giti Farudi, the head of the Department of Languages, and I'm joined by my colleagues from the department, Dr. Susan Spillman, Dr. Elizabeth Roussel, Brother Herman Johnson, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Carmen Cosme, and also uh, our colleagues from the Center of International Intercultural Programs, Dr. Yu Jing and Ms. Cranley. So we're going to talk to you about creating a faculty-led summer study program. Um, I have my program in Costa Rica, which I started in, in 2014. So I'll give you a little bit of background about my program and about how I tried to make it successful and which now I think it is uh, rather successful. And then I will, uh, my colleagues will speak about their experiences with study abroad and also why including a foreign language component is, is so important when you're um, creating a program. So as you can see from this chart that I put here, um, when I started in 2014, I had an enrollment of nine students, and it was a huge struggle to get those nine students, believe it or not. So it took a lot of time, a lot of effort, but we did it. We got nine students, and it was it was a great program. Um, the students enjoyed it, but you can also see by the chart that then the enrollment started to drop. So I didn't do the program in 2015, but 2016, it went down to seven. And then by 2017, I only had five students in the summer program. So that was a little bit uh, scary and problematic. So I stayed a little bit longer that summer in Costa Rica and I decided to add a clinical observational component because I felt that that would be very attractive for the students. So I met with a lot of physicians and medical groups and I came up with this plan to include um, an observational component. So as you can see, I was right about that prediction because the enrollment went up to um, 16 students in 2018, which for many the schools or universities, that might not be a huge number, but that was a huge success for me and, and for us. So that was a very attractive component. Um, and then last year I had 18 students and this year it's uh, already a great enrollment. We have about 15 deposits and it's very early. So um, that was a really crucial thing that I, that I included. Um, also the program is is very unified. So it has the medical Spanish class. So they hear the vocabulary that they're going to hear and listen to and use when they're doing the observations and the shadow. Um, we also, the other activities that we do are have, have to do with um, medicine or the excursions. So it's all rather unified. Um, so that's kind of how the program works. Um, I'll talk to you a little bit about other things that are really important in planning the program. Um, my next slide is talking about the preparation. So starting so early. I think it's a great idea to start the summer before and then um, and then start promoting the first week that we're back because it takes lots of time. The students need to get prepared. They need to talk to their parents. And also just the logistics on your end takes a lot of time. So the earlier that you can start, the better off that you'll be and the better off that the program will be, the more comfortable the students will, will feel. And also just a promotion and a Center for International Intercultural Programs can help you a lot with that. But I use all, all kinds of methods. So website, flyers, um, Twitter, even Instagram, any way that you think that you can reach the students and let them know about your program it's really, really helpful because surprisingly, they don't know um, that it's possible or maybe they just, they know it's possible, but they don't know how. So any way that you can reach out to them and let them know the steps that they can take to, to do the program is, is uh, very, very helpful. Um, so yes, and then following up with them. If they express interest, do, do follow up with them as well. Um, another thing is the partner organization. So I, think that choosing a partner organization is important. It does drive the cost up a bit. So there are some that think maybe it's not a good idea to have a partner organization, but I think it, it, it is, it is. <laughs> because 
for one, they help you a lot with logistics. So even things like trans uh, the airport transfers, it will be a nightmare for you in the spring semester to try and plan that logistically. It's like almost impossible because of our, uh, you know, other things that we have to do during the semester. So they can help you with things like that. They can help you with finding the home stays and that sort of thing. Also, it's like an added level of uh, feeling um, of feeling safe because you are there res responsible for the students and so many things can happen while you're there. I could talk about that for another hour, but the, the point is you need to have that sense of, of feeling safe for your own peace of mind because you're responsible for them. It's not their country and a lot of things can happen. So the partner organization provides you with that kind of peace of mind. Um, and they can help you with insurance and things like that. So that's important. Um, they can also help you with the classroom space. So the, the class is like a huge important part of the study abroad. Um, which leads me to my next slide. So there's kind of a, people sometimes think, oh, study abroad can just be like a vacation. They're just going abroad for a month in another country. But it should definitely not be like that. So if you include all the components that I've been talking about, it should not. They should have a well-rounded experience um, and have a lot of experiential learning activities. Um, and you, like, as I've said, that just takes a lot of planning, but it should definitely not be a big thing. You should get a lot out of it. So, and, and learn a lot about the culture and the language. So the language component is, um, very important and it's, it's very attractive. So the students want to learn another language. Um, oh, well, the language, <laughs> the language is my last slide. Funding, yeah. Anyway, it's very attractive for the students because they want to go abroad, they want to get something out of it. So if they can get a proficiency in a second language in their month um, or improve upon their skills, that's something that they want and that will make your program attractive. Um, the funding also, so the funding is a huge, huge struggle for us here at Xavier. Um, it's, all, it's always been. But one thing that I can recommend is meeting individually with the students, talking to them about their situation. It, because in faculty-led programs, it is Xavier credits that they're receiving. They can, um, sometimes their financial aid package will help them with that part of the cost, with the credits. Um, Ms. Lee can also help them looking for scholarships that they can apply for. I always recommend that they use um, GoFundMe and do their own funding starting very early. And they've had a lot of success with that. I never recommend that they should go into any sort of debt for their summer study, but believe it or not, they can come up with funds. If you guide them and you meet with them and you help them, they really can do it. So if it's something that they're interested in, you can help them find the funds. And now uh, Dr. Grant's office also helps give, giving funds for the exponential scholars. So that's really great. Um, okay. Uh, that's all that I will say because I uh, will let the others speak as well. But good luck with your program. If you have any questions, if you uh, have any suggestion, if you uh, want to talk to me about building your own program, please uh, please contact me. And Dr. Silver has a program in Martinique, so she'll talk about, about that. If you have one quick question in response to yours, uh, does Xavier have a list of third partners? We do, yes. Yes. And is that through? Yes. Yeah, yeah, several. Yes. Okay. Can start for CIE? We have to do that. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Yes.
Okay, as you'll notice from my promotional video, one of the best ways I think to increase interest in our study abroad programs is to do some innovative things as far as publicity. And please notice that in the video, you do have a bit of geographical orientation. The students get an idea of where Martinique and Guadeloupe are, but I deliberately avoided any beach pictures, nobody frolicking on the beach, nobody frolicking in the water because it is extremely important, in my opinion, for any programs in the Caribbean to emphasize the fact that they are academic programs. And I found when I started looking at other people's publicity for their programs in Martinique and Guadeloupe that there is much too much emphasis on palm trees and sunsets and so forth. So it's very important for the students to have an appropriate mindset. I share this short video in my classes when I take a few minutes to talk about how it can be advantageous to go on the Martinique program. But why do we have the Martinique program? What is there about Martinique that's so important for us? Why don't we just send the students who are interested in studying French to France or to Quebec? What we do is that we integrate very carefully with our Martinique program, the study of le phénomène créole, what is creolité? What is creolization? And because of our close ties with Martinique, our close ties with the Antilles, and our cultural similarities, we feel that it is extremely advantageous for our students to get an idea of this. Okay, how did all this come about? The state of Louisiana took two delegations of people in 1917 and again, I mean, in 2017 and 2018 to visit Martinique and on the second one to visit Guadeloupe to get an idea of what was available. This gave rise to memoranda of understandings between Louisiana State University, other universities, and us. So this made it possible for us to offer courses at the Université des Antilles Paul Martinique and for our students to study there with a minimum of administrative complication. Okay, so what do we have in our program that is not quite the same as the program in uh, the medical program in Costa Rica. We do not have a participating partner. Now, why don't we? Well, I looked around to see what people have to offer in Martinique, and I was not impressed with the selection. However, at the same time, because we had built this relationship with Martinique, we had gone and a number of the universities in the state had developed memorandum of understanding. We entered into a direct relationship with the study abroad office at the Université des Antilles in Martinique. This has been very fruitful. It has the advantage in that we are not working through a third person so that we have direct contact always with our collaborating partners. However, you can imagine there are disadvantages because it's on us to do all the logistics which is something. Fortunately, we have a superb collaborating partner or several at the Université des, de, des Antilles, Professor Miriam Moise, who has been our primary organizing partner in uh, Fort de France for the first two years of the program. She's now a Fulbright Fellow in, at Emory University, so we will miss her, but her wonderful colleague, Professor Dominique Aurelia, is going to take over and we're looking forward to working with her. Okay, I cannot say this enough. We need to do whatever we can to help our students as far as money is concerned. Because if you look at the flyer that I put in front of you, on the back of the flyer, I have a lot of the advantages of the program, which I think are superb. I've looked at other programs in Martinique and they do not have the same variety of cultural immersion experiences. And what we want is for our program in Martinique to be a real cultural immersion. The students live with families. Uh, they take their meals with the family. The families usually have fallen in love with them and take them on excursions on the weekend. And so that has worked out nicely. However, we do make sure that they do things that are typical of Martinique culture. Uh, we take them to Montpellier, uh, they have a lecture about the volcano. We explore the ruins in St. Pierre. 
They go yodel sailing. My very favorite is the hike in Emihod National Park and the Nature Preserve, which is beautiful. They do have beach days. We have dolphin observations. We take them to the rum distillery. Now you might say, why do we take them to the rum distillery? The rum distillery is extremely important in the history of slavery. So you cannot understand the history of slavery uh, unless you go to see the rum distillery because it takes the whole process from the growing of the sugar cane through the milling of the rum. And we see how that came about and its intense reliance on slave labor. In addition, we have other cultural activities. We have a Creole cuisine class and we all cook. And that is extremely popular. We go to the workshop of Monsieur Victor Anissé, who is an internationally recognized ceramic artist, and he shares his creative process with us, and that cannot be overemphasized how wonderful that is. We have a dance atelier. We learn how to do the ballet, the traditional dances. We have a percussion workshop, and we also go to the open air market, and there we do a culture exercise in which we have to go through the market and pretend that we're buying certain things and the person who sells them has to initial each student's card that he or she located. Them. As far as the courses that we teach, this we have worked on. Um, we had originally had the intention of having six hours of coursework for each time that we went, but this makes the price almost uh, inaccessible for most of our students. So we do have to work on money. We do have to try to make sure that we find ways for the students to come up with funding. And we have been very, very fortunate so far uh, in collaborating partners and so forth and so on that we have been able to make this available to the students. When they see the price, $3,500, which is tuition, the homestay, the cultural excursions, and then on top of that, we have airfare, they start to get extremely stressed. And we can understand that. So there are things that we're still working on. There are things that we want to perfect, but I cannot recommend enough that students consider the program in Martinique. And one thing, one of my dreams for the program in Martinique is that we will integrate more with the science faculty, our science colleagues, because in Guadeloupe, there is a wonderful branch of the Université des Antilles that is focused on the sciences. So the students who need summer research opportunities, I dream of the day when they will be able to do those there. Thank you, and I, je donne la parole and my colleague. Thank you so much, Dr. Spillman. That was very informative. Um, I'm going to go back to something that Professor Faroudi emphasized, which was language study, foreign language study before you go to the, before the students go to the country. Um, I think that that, we all think that uh, from the language department, that that is really, really important that the students study language. Before that, I'm going to talk about some of the myths about foreign language. Unfortunately, it makes sense that we have these myths um, circulating because um, one of the things uh, that stands out to me is that one of the myths is students already know uh, foreign language or Spanish or whatever before they come to Xavier. Um, in fact, if we look at the statistics, which are out based on a report in 2015, 17 from Education Week magazine, it says that actually in public schools, public K-12 schools, only 20% of students are actually studying a foreign language. And in at least two states, didn't identify which two states, uh, it was actually 10%. Um, so that's pretty frightening. And uh, of the students, the 20%, between 10% and 20% of students, high school, uh, high school or any K-12 public school, of those students, 69.21% uh, of them are studying Spanish, 12.12% are studying French, 3.11% are study, studying German, 2.13% Chinese, 1.98% uh, Latin, 1.23% uh, American Sign Language, 0.64% Japanese, 0.24% Arabic, and 0.14% Russian of, of those uh, students who um, are studying foreign language. We can agree that that's not very many students if it's 20, between, between 10 and 20% of K-12 public school students. 
Another myth is that students don't need to know another language because everyone in the world speaks English. Actually, this is also false uh, because in fact, 75% of the world and in some statistics, um, Recently, um, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in 2019 is saying 75%, but there's a Babel.com article in 2017 that says there's actually only 20% of people in the world speak English. It's 1.5 billion speakers in general out of 7.5 billion people, and only 360 million of those people actually speak English as their native language. And furthermore, uh, recent reports have come out that the most commonly spoken language, in fact, is Mandarin, followed by Spanish, followed by English. So we can be very proud that at, at Xavier University of Louisiana that we at least have the Confucius Lang uh, Institute and we can have Mandarin. Uh, we obviously have English and that our Spanish programs are getting stronger. Um, another myth is that language and culture are not related. Uh, this is a preposterous um, thought. Um, I think that people like to think that to say that we don't need foreign language study, but in fact, we can see that so easily just in, for example, some people think that in the American speaking English uh, version of English that we use a lot of superlatives <laughs> like awesome, amazing, great, uh, wonderful. And that is reflected in our culture of enthusiasm and smiling everywhere we go. That's our reputation around the world anyway. Uh, we can see this in the frequent use of the word our in the Korean language, which expresses their emphasis on collectivism. We can see this in the Japanese language reflecting uh, a lot of nature in their vocabulary because nature is very important to them. And I'm sure that our Chinese colleagues can give us lots of examples. So this is a preposterous statement that language and culture are not related and that if students take language classes, foreign language classes, that they will not be learning about culture. Um, another myth is that students don't le learn much in a first semester foreign language course. This is also preposterous because actually students are bombarded with information. And you can imagine that if these students are part of the ones who did not have any language in K foreign language in K-12, wow, they get to learn how to conjugate a verb. Um, they get to un understand what that concept is. Um, they, they are able when they get out of 1010 and 1020 uh, at least in the online classes um, that are infused with nothing but the language, uh, they are able to speak in videos uh, for three minutes uh, or four minutes about themselves, about everyday topics. Um, and, and, and if we put this other disciplines to this test about, oh, well, you don't, we could say the same about, oh, I don't learn, what do you learn in first semester biology? You can't, you can't go out and do research in biology by yourself. And so I think it's very unfair when we say, oh, well, what are you going to learn in these uh, first semester courses? Also, I think that these first semester courses can be very motivating for students to say, wow, I really want to go to Mount Kamit now that I know some basic French. Wow, I really want to go to Cuba because I just learned uh, Spanish and I learned a lot about um, Afro-Cuban uh, culture because my professor is interested in that and she taught me about that in the class. Um, and another myth is that students will not reach any proficiency. And as I just went over, that's really patently not true uh, because especially in these courses, 10, 10, 10, 20 online, we are requiring that they make final videos, that they not read, that they uh, practice them for two weeks, that they synthesize all the material that they have learned uh, previously in the class that semester. And so, and then also, even in Thai beginning Spanish, uh, 1090, students are speaking with native speakers on the website talkabroad.com, where they're actually conducting conversations for 30 minutes with talk abroad speakers who are from another country. And those people are trained not to speak any English or they will lose their job. And it's amazing uh, how well the students do. Um, another myth is that study abroad can replace foreign language learning on college campuses. Drake University actually tried to do this in the late 90s. They said, well, you know what, we don't need to put any money into foreign language uh, education. Uh, the students can just go um, study abroad and learn it abroad. Um, that is also ridiculous because for two reasons. 
Uh, the first reason is that I know from experience that students can go and sequester themselves in a, in a study abroad program and hang out with Americans the entire time and speak nothing but English. Um, by the same token, I could be in a very infused, immersed class on campus as I was in my undergraduate experience with native speakers who refuse to speak English in class and it's a 10-10 class and we're doing a skit and I'm actually learning more there because I'm forced to speak the language. So study abroad is not going to replace uh, foreign language uh, learning. Um, also, another myth is that students don't need foreign language study before they go abroad to the country where another language is spoken. That is also really dangerous. And I have first day at hand knowledge of students actually having a nervous breakdown uh, because they had had absolutely no exposure to the language of the country they were going to study it. So that actually creates a recipe for disaster. Um, I'd also like to further talk about uh, relevance of language study. Um, there was a big uh, controversy at Cornell University recently about are they going to get rid of their foreign language department? And one of the professors there, I think, made uh, two very wise quotes. Uh, he said, studying a language other than one's own helps students understand the dynamics of language, our fundamental intellectual tool, and enables students to understand another culture. Again, we see the link between language and culture. And I think one of the best things that this professor at Cornell emphasized was that language is our fun fundamental intellectual tool. So why would we want to limit ourselves with one language? Why would we want not want to, to learn more about our own native tongue by studying somebody else's uh, language? And also furthermore, why would we not want to get out of our comfort zone and see and be able to empathize with the many people who are coming to the United States who cannot speak English? So you don't even have to leave the country to foster this empathy. Uh, another thing that this uh, Cornell um, <laughs> person said is you can't be a global citizen if you're monolingual. And I don't understand how we have um, that we that students are going to be global citizens in our mission statement at Xavier and they are not required to study another language, even if it is one semester for the reasons that I have just given you. Um, and then, of course, there is this link between language and culture, which is stated here by Wiki Magazine in 2019. I'm going to finish what I have to say um, with also some commentary about how foreign language study is linked with social justice, which is also a very important part of our mission. Recent studies show that bilingualism benefits low-income children. People had thought that it was uh, uniquely for high-income kids because, oh, they have the opportunity to study, study foreign language and low-income children do not. For low-income children who do, they have the same memory, planning, attention, and problem-solving skills benefits, and they also benefit from task switching when they have to go into the other language. And so, we need to be a part of solving this problem that poor students are not being exposed to another language, which could help them so much intellectually. Um, and also in 2017, there was a report by the Academy of uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, which says that 44 states in Washington, DC have a shortage of qualified foreign language instructors at the K-12 level. So this would explain why so few students are taking foreign language. And then I'm just gonna end with um, J. William Fulbright. Um, we know him from his founding of the Fulbright Scholarship. In the fight against totalitarianism, the greatest weapon is not a weapon at all, but the soft diplomacy of mutual understanding between cultures. And so obviously studying a foreign language at any level is a huge part of this. And obviously we are in this uh, crisis right now, and we need foreign language more than ever. So I would encourage you strenuously to have your study, your students study a foreign language before they go abroad, and understand that there is this very important connection between study abroad in another country with a language other than English and studying the foreign language. Thanks. Um, one question and comment from online. Wondering about the use of the work 
It's a perfect sequence that I follow Dr. Roussel. I'd like to uh, Dr. Spillman said and uh, Dr. Faroudi, but what Elizabeth said follows what I want to say. As a um, religious person at a, uh, a faith-based uh, university founded by a Catholic sister, um, I, I, I like the idea what Elizabeth talked about, helping people be more uh, recognize the fact that as human beings, even though we have different cultures, we're fundamentally the same. Here in New Orleans, we're kind of tribal. Um, we, as a Black person, I could not know anything about white people in the neighboring neighborhood and vice versa. Uh, schools as institutions of higher ed should be at the forefront of breaking down the tribal me mentality that we have. Uh, language study and study abroad has helped me break down the tribal world that I was born in. Uh, for example, something real, higher ed cannot participate in this tribal attitude. Like if we see Asians, the Asian, uh, the Chinese, let's face it, it's embarrassing for each cultural group to admit. But I see, I see we look at Chinese and say, those people, white people, black people, Language study help us become sensitive that other people are human beings just like us. When we learn the intricacies and deal with the challenge of second language learning, we learn how other people think and we find out that we're fundamentally the same. Everybody likes to be very unique, but language learning as with other learning, but specifically language learning is a spiritual act because we come out of ourself, we come out of our narrow limitation about who we are because born in a tribal society like New Orleans and the US, I can tend to stay in my little narrow reservation because I have this illusion that I'm gonna be just wait. And I never leave out of my world and, and become a new person enriched by uh, learning from Chinese people, learning the uh, beauty of white people, of Spanish and learning their language, coming out of myself and allowing myself to become uh, a, diff a, 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 a ongoing growing person. I'm not just one thing. And so I think uh, it's very important that schools, high schools, especially universities, do not participate in the tribal mindset that, oh, language, high school uh, is enough for second language acquisition. To stop language learning is keeping people narrow-minded and not going out, and it's not contributing to a just and humane world. Even one year will help a young person who's not language oriented to enjoy the experience of travel to another country. Uh, when I went to Germany, I only had one year, but I wasn't totally isolated walking around Germany and saying, oh, those German people. No, I was able to enter in. I was able to save your restaurant experiences better. So I'm saying the obvious to us in here about the importance of second language learning is not just to promote a discipline, but it's also to help people be more whole, enriched human beings. And that we learn to think about ourselves and others different. And that contributes, that's what really contributes to a just and humane world. That I come to see people who are not like me, that they are me. In following uh, all the voices of my colleagues, I want to start my presentation by giving you myself as an example of how a study abroad programs and a study abroad experiences liberates oneself. Because I also believe, like Brother Herman, that learning about anything, specifically the language, because we are human, 
it's a spiritual process. So I am calling my presentation story about Liberate, the personal story by me, that Connie Paul Smith and Pierce. There we go. Now, what do I mean by that? Some of you might know that I was raised, born and raised in the Dominican Republic. Dominican Republic is a part of an island in the Caribbean that is divided by or between Haiti and the Dominican Republic called La Hispaniola. I was born in the north of the island uh, where more people um, just survive by producing products, agricultural products. But as we know, the new um, capitalist systems and how we constantly need change and need to evolve, people move around, so we migrate. So my family migrated from the north all the way to the south to go to the main capital. At the time, uh, when I was 18, they decided that we had to leave, in my, in my case, I have to leave the, the, my island, my home, my family, my friends, and move to New York City. Uh, when I moved to New York, I live in the Bronx, I live in Queens, I live in Long Island. When I live in Long Island, I travel to Queens, I travel to the Bronx, I travel constantly to Manhattan. My life continued, maintained the continued movement that I knew growing up from the north all the way to the south in the island. So as you can imagine, coming from an island, uh, coming from a small space to this vast, mega New York City, where there are a lot of, uh, I mean, my island only has about 8 million people. And, 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 and going to New York was going to another island, yes, but a global world, a cosmopolitan city. So speaking Spanish from my hometown, uh, it served me to the age of 18, but coming to New York, where I have to work and I have to study, English was the language to learn. Now, I'm traveling abroad. I moved from the Caribbean to North America, the power country, the United States of America. So everyone will say to me at the time, it used to say to me at the time, you need to learn English. <laughs> if you are going to progress, you need to learn English at work. <laughs> speak English. So I learned quickly that English was, it was going to be very important. And I, I needed to acquire that tool to move forward. You see, um, some of the jobs that you can get when you learn a second language could be, I mean, with basic education, could be very limiting, very limiting. We're talking about like babysitting, um, housekeeping, uh, become a janitor at a building, uh, fast food restaurant, um, waitressing, things, jobs that are usually common among people here in the United States that already have a citizenship and already speaks English, right? So for any immigrant from Latin America or the Caribbean coming here and starting those kind of jobs, it was a huge step to progress. So I saw that as a liberation because I was from my island where I had no progress being what you're talking about, Brother Herman, a tribal society where we implement where women really don't go out there to provide for the family. And here I am, or oh, getting a, a, a formal education at the higher level, it was limiting, especially for people like me from a social economic status that was very low. So I'm emphasizing this transition of a studying abroad because studying to me in the United States brought me the opportunity to actually get a formal education at a higher education institution. Um, I became a, an educator, a second, secondary education educator in New York. And by the time I was graduating, uh, I already has, have learned um, three languages. And you might ask why. I thought it was just English. 
But I realized that I was limiting myself by just learning English because my environment was so diverse. I used to work with a lot of people from Italy, from the north of Italy, from the south of Italy, from Rome. Uh, so I became very, um, I was excited about learning from all the people from all the parts of the world. So I said, oh, wow, that would be nice to learn. And I did. I learned a lot of different Spanish from all over South America and the Caribbean. I exposed myself to so much because I learned English. Once you learn English, I was in a space, an academic space where I encounter all these new languages and new people. So I said, wow, now meeting people from Brazil, from Cape Verde, from Mozambique, from Angola, I said, hey, I wanna learn Portuguese. And yeah, it was expensive, I'm not gonna lie to you, but you know what, there were scholarships. There were people in my university that provided that opportunity for me. Professors, professors, my professors, they encouraged me to leave New York and experience all the places like Spain. I never thought in a million years when I was in, in the Dominican Republic that I would travel to Spain. And I traveled to Spain as a student and I learned the culture. I was emerging into a program in, in Madrid and I just learned this, new environment, new culture. And I'm not gonna lie to you, yes, culture shock. You know, it happens. Uh, what was another one? Yeah, I noticed a lot of cultural differences within that space. I constantly cut. I don't know why, but I was not missing McDonald's or Burger King. I was actually missing my rice and bean. So I became very mm -hmm. <laughs> homesickness was like really bad. It was horrible. And of course, ethnocentrism. I kept telling people, you know, oh, for we, we do this and this is the best and new york is the best and um the caribbean is the best and so i you know but i was exposed to unlearn that behavior so once i made a decision to unlearn that behavior of ethnocentrism i opened my mind i liberated my mind to another level feel free from everything <laughs> When you travel abroad, I realized I didn't have to worry so much anymore about paying rent. I know, it was a concern, especially for a young woman in New York. And so I thought, okay, how can I be, become resourceful and use the money, right, that I'm using to pay rent to, um, and food, because it's expensive, to, you know, I uh, signed up for a study abroad program. So I did, and I came, you know, there are partners like you guys were talking about, and organizers from other parts of the world that are willing to work with you. And all that information today is available here at Savior, it's available on the internet. You can connect with people all over through social media and find a little nook, a little place in the world where you want to go and just liberate your spirit to learn another language, to learn another culture, to learn so much about yourself. So in these pictures that you see, I was in Colombia, in the Pacific side of Colombia, and I was in the Dominican Republic. I went back home. Yes, not as a tourist, but as a director of a story abroad program for my students. Then now, as an educator, say, I can, you know, I can give my students that opportunity too, to feel free. You don't have to worry about paying rent or paying the bills. You can get your cell phone when you leave because all the study abroad programs that at least that we are providing and this university and others, they provide that for you. So it is expensive, but yet it's like you're investing in your future by allocating the money and moving it to another location. Um, connect with people. Yeah, a lot of times we find places where people look different, people sound different, but we all human, we have in common a human experience. So when you go abroad, you know, mix with people, don't, and don't uh, connect with people. A lot of the faculty here, we travel constantly to conferences and we, don't, we sometimes take it, uh, take it for granted that we are surrounded by differences. So embrace that difference and, and network. Okay, I wanna do this a study abroad program with Xavier and your university, how do you like that? So that's what I'm working on right now, trying to connect with Colombia and Cuba. Contemplate the beauty of traveling abroad. 
contemplate the beauty. This photo was taken in Salvador da Bahia, it's Colorinho. And I was just up in the building looking out and realized how lucky I am to connect with the Afro-Brazilian at this level, to connect with the roots. I learned more Portuguese from the black people of Brazil and I learned how we connect in history and it really empowered me to not just learn the language, but also learn about their religions, the Afrocentric culture. And it, when I came back to the US, I gotta tell you, I felt like a new person. I connected with my students as well that I was, that was another story. Uh, we talked about uh, women's studies, social justice education. They um, become very much involved with the um, Tejeros and Salvador da Bahia, those are religion temples. Uh, they got involved with uh, uh, women, especially teenagers, that um, teen teenage pregnancy. So it is not going to start a person not just learning language. It's actually merging yourself into everyone's life. And, and you really change. And you change. You come back to your country and realize that 20 pair of shoes is too much. You can actually live with two. Um, enjoy life. Yep. You also want to learn the history, not just the history of the United States, the history of Louisiana, the history of New Orleans, but you want to make sure that you bring the students and teach them about the history of their space, whether they are here or abroad, uh, the history of their life. Um, investigate. We are academics. The students also have that opportunity here to do a study abroad. Dr. Grant is giving um, us as faculty opportunities to mentor uh, students um, and, and get money from the university to take them abroad. So I think that's important. So be curious. Reinvent yourself. What is it that we want our students to do? We want our students to graduate, right? But we want them to get a global education. Uh, we want them to become, as Oprah Winfrey said once, citizens of the universe. So how can they achieve that just by staying in one space? So that's another tip and teach. Teach them how to teach. You teach them, they teach you, and, and, and break that um, myth that the students are, cannot be better than the professor, the professors cannot never be a student. Mix it up. And also uh, celebrate, celebrate with people, celebrate their culture, celebrate who they are, but most importantly, celebrate with yourself and the loved ones. Every time you travel abroad, enjoy the differences in celebrations because at the end of the day, that is what are we here for, to share love, connection, food, dancing, um, and difficulties. So cross frontiers. Don't limit yourself as academics, as professors, just to your own learning experience. Share that with your students in the classroom and study abroad. Share your knowledge. What's the point of going to school to get a doctorate and you're not gonna share that knowledge with your students and with others in the world? And be happy. So, gracias, obrigada, gracias, thank you. Sure, sure.